Hello everyone, I'm here today with Marcus Sheridan from the Sales Lion. And a little bit about Marcus, uh, back in 2001 and fresh out of college, Marcus stumbled upon his first business with two friends and began installing swimming pools. Nine years later, and with the help of incredible innovations through inbound and content marketing, Sheridan's company overcame the collapse of the housing market and became one of the largest pool installers in the U.S. and currently has the most visited swimming pool website in the world, which is riverpoolsandspas.com. With such success, in late 2009, Marcus started his sales and marketing and personal development blog called The Sales Lion and has since grown The Sales Lion brand to be synonymous with inbound and content marketing excellence while being featured in multiple industry publications, including The New York Times, where he was referred to as a web marketing guru. And today, we are going to be talking about working video into the culture of your organization and how to get started. Marcus, how are you doing today? Doing great, man. Excited to chat. 2017 is here, and so the question is, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> so it's a good time to be talking. Yes, it is, and it's, I'm, I'm always, always, always excited to talk with you. You uh, you have an energy about you that, that's infectious. So I uh, want to uh, just kind of dig right in. Um, and uh, but before we get into, you know, how, how to get started and, and – and, you know, with video and working into your culture. First, I want you to just give me your take on the importance of video and why everyone should consider producing them uh, for their businesses. Well, there's a really simple way I like to look at this, and it's this. At this point, 2017 and beyond, if we don't show it, whatever it is, but if we don't show it as companies, it doesn't exist. Let me give you an example. It makes me laugh if you go to a website and you read the company talking about the thing that makes them different is that we have great people. It's our people that makes us different. Well, guess what? Everybody else in the world also says their people make them different. Nobody says our people aren't special. And nobody says that. And because every company says it, saying it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's not until we show it that it means something. So if you want people to believe that your people are special, well, you have to show the thing. If you mm -hmm. want people to believe that your product is unique, that your services are are different, you have to show the thing. And video is far and away the easiest and, and currently the most effective way to show the thing. Mm -hmm. I love how you say currently, right? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what 2018 or 19 or 20 is going to bring us. But you're right. Right now, video is has been hot. Um, we just did that takeaway piece, and, and there was a ton of talk about it again. I, it's uh, it's uh, it's just growing in, in importance, uh, not not just for us, but for what you know Facebook wants to show and what people want to um, consume. So, yeah, absolutely. And you made a good point about um, your employees. I mean, just and again, we'll be digging into a lot of this here in a second. But just in general, like that that alone is is a perfect example. Like, don't just say it, don't just have pictures. But if you bring a personality out of like a customer service rep. You know, and they people feel that, see it through the video, then that actually makes you think, well, yeah, that person is somebody I'd want to work with. That that that's a, just a, a great first pointer to for someone wanting to get started, shoot your business, so uh, shoot your employees. So, getting started here, w what would you say the first step is a company should take to start incorporating a video producing culture? Well, I really think the first thing that you have to do, and it's kind of like if you're going to start content marketing, right? First thing you have to do is you've got to get everybody together that might be involved. Okay. And you have to help them see the what, the how, and the why. They got mm -hmm. to see it. They got to understand it. And here's how you know they know. Because if they can teach you why it's important the company does video, well, then they've got it. But mm -hmm. if they can't explain it to you or explain it to their friends or explain it to their coworkers and the peers, but they don't got it yet. 
and you haven't gotten past level one. Level one is that everyone agrees that's important and they understand their role and how they're going to be involved, what the impact is on the individual, what the impact will be on the collective. That's level one, okay? Mm -hmm. um, level two is you put the right people in the right seats in the bus, right? So in other words, one of the reasons why content marketing fails and one of the reasons why video fails is because we'll have a person that kind of knows video handling the video elements of the company. Well, the problem is the person that kind of knows video is also wearing 12 other hats, and those 12 don't include video. You see, unless somebody is dedicated to something, unless they have an obsession about that thing, there's a good chance they're not going to be very special at that thing. And so this is why you see a lot of companies fail with producing content because nobody owns it. It's not a single person's obsession. They try to get to it. Well, if we got time to it, we'll get to that. You see what I'm saying? This is, you know, accountants are generally good because they obsess over the numbers. You don't ask accountants to be your sales manager. They don't go there. They do what they do. They work the numbers. That's their obsession. Sales managers obsess over sales. That's it. That's what they do. That's what they do. And so if you're going to be great with video, you're going to need somebody that can handle this. And for most companies, I think at this point, not all of them, but for many companies, that means a full-time videographer. Now, sometimes, because the company's not big enough, you might have a content manager that also has video skills. So, for example, let's say the company's a smaller organization and there's just no money in the budget to bring in two people. So then I would go after somebody that has maybe a major in journalism and a minor in mass media because they can therefore do both. They've got both skill sets. Because you got to be able to still write, it, edit, and interview. If you can't write, edit, interview, you got problems. You got problems. But you got to have video chops. You got to have video chops. And so that's why having a content manager that can do both is good. But if a company is doing more than $5 million a year, let's say, and they want to justify not doing both, you're going to lose that argument with me every time because there's no reason in the world. There's no reason in the world. The only reason, if you're doing $5 million and above, let's say, the only reason why you wouldn't have both is because you don't yet get it. You just don't feel like it's important. It's not because you can't afford it because, frankly, you can't afford not to do it at this point. Not if you truly get where we're all headed as digital consumers and buyers. It's, you know, the sales line, which is my consulting uh, company, we, we're not a huge company. We're only five full-time employees. We do just over a million dollars a year in revenue, but we've got a full-time content manager and a full-time videographer. This is why, you see, I don't have pity on people that say, we're just not big enough for that. <laughs> okay? Oh. And, it, you know, in companies that are doing five, 10, 20, 50 million dollars a year, tell me that. I'm like, you just don't get it. You don't have the vision. Yeah. 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 And um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I see what you're saying. And, and I know the feeling, but, and, I, and there's actually some questions that I'm going to be asking you about that as far as the quality and all that to kind of reshape uh, people's ways of thinking about where they should need to get going. But, but before we, I mean, and so, so I, I couldn't be in agreement more that it's more of a mindset than, a, than an actual, an actuality. But to speak, a little bit about what you're talking about, somebody owning it. I mean, that's definitely the whole initiative. But as far as like somebody being in front of the camera, you know, I've seen you talk about that in the past. But can you give somebody, somebody some guidance, you know, the person who is owning this, be it, you know, somebody assigned to it or maybe even the possibly the owner of a smaller company? How, how would one identify who should be in front of the camera, not behind well, it? Well, let's first address, let's first address one of the major elephants of this. It's the it's the person on your team that says, I'm just not good on camera or video's not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I fundamentally have a big problem with that statement. And the reason why I have a big problem with it is the same reason why buyers have a big problem with it. And here's the reason why. Because the moment somebody on your team asks a potential customer for their money, they lose the right 
to say things like, I don't want to do video just because I don't like it, you lose the right to do that. Because that's called part of being in a business, and that's just something that has to occur at this point if we expect people to trust us. And so if 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 we're going to sit here and ask somebody for their money, we're saying to them, trust me, I'm good. I'm good for this. And then if we turn around and say, but I'm not going to give them the ability to fully trust me, well, then they were really, really flawed. Somehow we're off the mark. And besides, at some point, they're going to see your face and hear your voice anyway. And so if you're meeting with them face-to-face, -face, ultimately, how is that different than video? It, for the visual senses, it is essentially the same experience. They're going to look at you, and they're going to judge you in real life and on camera. That's how it works. And if you take the time to get good at it, they're going to judge you in a way that's like, wow, this person gets me. They understand me. I like the way they sound. I like the way they talk. They're believable. They're honest. And this is the type of person that I want to do business with. And that's the, that's the idea. That's the goal. And so we shouldn't ever allow anybody to think have that mindset because it's just fundamentally flawed. Fundamentally flawed. We just got to get over it. And now, you can edit. <laughs> now, <laughs> and, what's and that? You can stop. As it in, you can edit. You know, uh, as far as taking the fear <laughs> element away, you can stop. You can well, start of course. over. I mean, of course, of course, you can edit, and that's really the second set. You know, if you want to be great with with video, there's two main rules that we use with companies. And I've done a lot of video training, had a lot of success with this with individuals and with organizations. I've taken people that said, "I just suck in front of the camera," and I've just, in a over the course of a couple hours. By the end, they're like, man, I'm good at this. I'm really good at this. Man, I'm awesome at this. <laughs> and so how do, you, how do you get to that point? Well, there's basically two rules, and they both come down to psychology, but the first one's the big one. This is the big one. So rule number one, and everybody that's on your team, anybody that's ever on camera should know this rule, and off camera too, especially your videographer. And that is this. Once you start a take, right, a segment of a video, once you start a take, you're not allowed to stop yourself and say, oh, I messed up. Let me start again. Not allowed. Against the rules. Here's the reason why. Because as soon as you, as soon as you allow yourself to stop for mistakes, you start making a lot more mistakes. It's weird. This is how it works. It's no different than there's a reason why news reporters that are live and on the scene you, they don't sit there and say, oh, I messed up, let's do that again. The reason is because they can't. They have to finish the take because <laughs> it's live. You, you have to just keep going. And so the rule is you have to keep going. You have to keep going. You've got to finish the take. So that's number that's one. Best. That's number one. Well, where did you get Number that? two. Marcus, what did you, is, that, um, is that some of your experience base? Because that's, I, you know, in hearing you say that, you know, I, I was actually just on a podcast the other day. Um, the Little Bird Marketing Podcast, and she asked me, hey, if you mess up, just let me know. We can edit it. And I, in my head, I was like, I'm going to do much better. If I, you know, if I fumble, I fumble. If I do, I do. That's natural. That's fine. I can live with it. And um, I didn't fumble. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, in my mind, and this just happened to me normally, right? I just thought that, you know, and, and it clicked for me, like, just just jump right in. Just go and don't worry about it. And I and I felt like I, I you know I did better. And so when you said that, it just struck a chord. And I've never heard anyone actually give that advice, though. I've never read it. I've never heard it. Never, so well, I'm very yeah, I don't think I've, is this, is I don't think I've that, read it anywhere either. I'll tell you where it started and yeah. and how it developed. Okay. It, it started. Sure. I was had a client once, and they brought in a videographer, and they literally would spend half hour maybe an hour to produce one two-minute video because they kept having to do retakes over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It drove me so crazy that I was ready to shoot the videography company by the time it was all done. I thought they were the worst. Like, here's the thing. They produced a fine product. They understood video, but they didn't understand psychology and communication. They didn't get it at all. Mm -hmm. And it bothered me so much that I said, well, how can I change this? And so I started teaching our clients, no matter what happens, 
you didn't say anything wrong. So you just keep going. You don't acknowledge it if it was, in your mind, not perfect. You just say it a better way. But you keep going, and you don't look back. Now, really, the principle is nothing that I invented. This has been around forever. Anybody that's been around acting, communication, et cetera, has heard the principle of yes and, which comes from the world of improv. But, you know, improv is, 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 is a powerful, powerful tool. And the principle of the improv can impact every element of our lives if we really understand them on a deep level. Now, improv is when you, you, you tell some, like you take two, quote, actors, and you give them a scenario, and you say, go up on stage and act it out. And they act it out, and it looks like they've been practicing for months, but they just heard it, you know, three minutes earlier what, you, what the mm-hmm. scenario was. And so it's, it's true impromptu acting. Now, there's one rule, though, to make improv great. And that rule is yes and. So in other words, if somebody says something, you agree with it and you just run with it. You go with their idea. You go with the thing. And so otherwise, you have a bad situation. And so so for example, so for example, let's say let's say that I'm just doing a, a silly improv example here. So you and I are the two actors and somebody says, okay, David and Marcus, I want you to go on stage and act out. You're, you're a pilot. You're both pilots, and your plane is crashing, um, and you just act out what you do next, right? And so then I start the scene. I'm like, David, we're going down. Oh, my goodness. We're screwed. We better go grab the life jacket. Now, we're in a plane. Why Marcus, would I say that? We're headed that? towards the mountains. <laughs> right. Why do we need so if jacket? you come out and say, Say, no, we don't need life jackets. We need parachutes. Now, we don't have comedy, nor do we have flow. But if you say, yes, the life jackets are perfect because if we jump and we hit the ground, maybe they will cushion the fall, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the moment where we make things up like that where you have magic, okay? And so this is the same principle that if anybody's ever seen me speak before, they know that I usually go into the audience and ask a lot of questions. And a lot of speakers say, dude, that's really dangerous. How do you pull it off? Well, I pull it off because everything that's said by the audience is right. doesn't matter what they say. I'm going to make it a victory for the person that said it and a victory for me as the speaker. Now, this also applies to singular communication. Let's say I'm the only one talking. No matter what I say, it's going to be right because I'm just going to keep moving forward. Even if in the course of, say, this conversation right here, let's say I said something wrong, you're not going to hear me fumble over myself. What will happen is I'll say, or you can look at it like this, and then I'll just say another way and better clarify my thoughts. That's how this works. That's the principle of yes and. And so basically you have to teach that. So if you want to be successful with video, if you teach this to your team on the front end before you start, and then you work with them on it, it's unbelievable what happens. Unbelievable. But you got to be religious about the rule of you can't start over once you've started. Once you've started. You can't stop yourself and start over. Excuse me. So that's number gotcha. one. Awesome. Number two, number two aligns itself with number one. Number two says, even though you're not allowed to stop a take in the middle, you are allowed to do it again. You're allowed to do it again. By doing it again, it gets interesting because what will happen is, you may do a take, and you may say, you know, that was okay, um, but I just feel like I might be able to do it better. And so you do it again. And you do it again, and then here's what happens with the videographer. The videographer might, might splice the two together because there is elements from both that they like. Or the second one might have been much better because at that point your brain, your mouth, your body, your mind was just more warmed up. You are better, and it, that's why we finished the first take. It's because what happens is there's elements of a conversation and each element of the conversation, each phase of the conversation uh, requires a, a practice almost in saying it, right? And so let's say that you're, you're doing a basic product demonstration video and there's three points to the product that you want to show. Well, if you keep stopping yourself during the first point, you never practice saying the third point. And so you, what happens is you go through the first two phases really well, and you get to the third one, and you, you fumble all over yourself, 
because you kept saying the first two over and over until you got them right, and the third one now jacked you up. And so the, the reason, one of the reasons why you go all the way through, oh, gotcha. even though you might have made a, a blatant mistake, is because you're practicing the different phases of that take to the point where you've done them all at least once now or twice or three times. And this is what happens when you follow these two simple principles. When you start with your team members, you'll find that at first, if you're doing a video, many of them will, will require two or three takes. It's just common at first. But by the end of the day or by the end of the third hour, whatever it is, you'll see everybody, their minds become quickened, they become smarter, better, faster. It's very interesting to watch this happen. And things keep happening with one take. It's very, very cool to watch, right? So like I've had, I've had, give you a sense for things. In general, when we go into a company, we do anywhere between 15 to 20 videos over the course of two to three hours. That's usually how long, is it, how long it takes us to do 15 to 20 videos, different videos. Um, and that might be more takes than that, but the videos we're going to render from that is 15 to 20. Now, think about that. Like, who can write 15 to 20 blog articles in two to three hours? I don't know who can do it, but it's not me, not anybody that I know. But you can absolutely do 15 to 20 videos in three hours. And my company just had a video fest that we did with the sales lion. And we did, I think it was 47 videos in a day and a half. That's yeah, I think that's standard for uh, talk about it's nothing, that, right? You yeah, it's nothing, about, but like it's nothing special. Hour deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the editing yeah. takes some time. What, what's your favorite editing tool? Oh, I don't, I don't get too much into you know, what is my not, favorite not, tool. Not your bag. Um, okay. I've got, and, and here's the reason why I don't. Is because each person you talk to is going to have a different take on it. They are. No, you're right. And you're so, right. and the issue with it too is this. Let's say you've got somebody that, you know, when we started with video with River Pools, we had, you know, I, I remember so well the first time that I ever um, did my first YouTube video. And I didn't understand anything to do with lighting or with audio. Um, I was sitting behind a desk, you couldn't see my body. This whole thing was a train wreck. Now, it got 150,000 views, but it was awful looking. But it was a victory. It was a victory because I did it, right? Because I did it. And at the time, I was using Windows Movie Maker. And Windows Movie Maker was the right editing software for me at the time because I was an idiot. And I just didn't know how to do any editing. And, you know, eventually we would graduate past Windows Movie Maker as a company because we started to integrate green screen into it, lots of overlays, music. And once you start to do that, you move out of things like, like Windows Movie Maker and you move on to some other types of software that are a better fit. But nobody should ever feel bad with using something outrageously, you know, don't feel bad for using iMovie. That's wonderful. Anybody that's using iMovie and producing video, I wanna give them a big fat high five. Because mm -hmm. it means that they're learning the thing. And companies have to accept that there's going to be some learning curve with this, unless they hire somebody that's experienced, and that's okay. But keep in mind, even if you hire, and let me, you know, I just hired a, a new videographer for River Pools. He's a good videographer. But one of our biggest tasks for 2017 is we want to create VR experiences, virtual reality experiences, for, um, for our sales team to use in the home um, with prospects. Now, he doesn't know anything about that, and he doesn't know anything about it because it's new, man. This is a new world. Right? The book hadn't even been written. And so he is learning it, and there's going to be a learning curve. I'm sure we're going to lose some money to to get to the point where he we get the right equipment, and he understands everything to the point where we can say, now we're doing VR in-house. But everything starts somewhere, right? And so yeah, it, we started it, with a couple couple guys that didn't know jack about video we did videos now we've got advanced video people that don't know jack about virtual that eventually will be good at virtual yeah no i i love you and that kind of leads me to something i read about a blog a blog that you put out and uh just goes into the whole you know anxiousness of 
Well, there, look at all these amazing videos you have uh, that are out there, right? And it could feel overwhelming because I don't want to put out something. I mean, look what they're doing. I mean, they could even be looking at a, a Nike commercial, right? So I, I want you to – I don't know if you remember what you said, and I'll read it. I wrote it down. I loved it so much. But well, I want you to you know, just speak to the people who are having that feeling of – well, I mean, look at look what Marcus is doing. You know, I, I can't produce anything like that. I might as well not do it because they're not probably looking at your first video. They're looking at your last. So what, what would you tell people about that? And, and I'll let me know if you need a refresher on what you actually said in a, in a, in a post about that. Well, I, mean, I could speak to this subject, honestly, all day because it's one of my m main passion areas. It's mm -hmm. also one of these things that drives me really crazy, David. Um, I have a, a very low tolerance level for the internet police, um, I, and, and they're the ones that cause these problems. So the internet police say things like, you shouldn't produce the content if it's already been said, or unless it's awesome, just don't even do it. Now, like, what defines awesome? And, like, what hasn't been said already? 90-plus uh, percent of all books that have ever been written they, they've already been written. This is like they're just they're just talking about the same subject. Are they anything new? I don't know. I mean, look at this whole idea of of if somebody's already done it or somebody's done it better, you shouldn't do it. Let's just go back to the most popular piece of content of all time in terms of total number of books published and read is the Bible, right? So if you look at the Gospels in the Bible, this is not, a, by the way, a religious conversation. This is a factual base. Let's look at it analytically conversation. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke, he didn't ever know Jesus. Like, he never met him because he wasn't around because he wasn't alive during that time. Luke was a historian that happened to write a gospel very similar to the other three as they had already done. So what would have happened if Luke had said, well, you got Matthew, Mark, and John. They already talked about this stuff, so I think I'm good. Like, is that not sad? Is that not, that, that would be terrible. And so luckily for a lot of people, Luke didn't say that. And he decided that what he had to say was worth talking about, that he could do some research, that he could be the historian that he was, and that he could report on his findings. And that's what he did. That's Content Marketing 101. And too many companies have bought into this idea of that it's got to be brand spanking new or it's got to be perfect, it's got to be awesome. The same applies to text and video. The same, the same thing. There, is, there has to be a learning curve. Mm -hmm. The companies that are willing to embrace the learning curve. And see, in the world of acting, that's called embracing the messy. It's a very common phrase. So when you get a script, when you do acting, you, everybody sits around the table and reads it. And they, and they do their character in, in many different ways. And a lot of it's messy. But you see, they do that because they, they understand that's how it is. They, mm -hmm. they like the feedback. They try it different ways. It's part of being an actor, all right? For some reason, when it comes to the communications arena, be it speakers or businesses, when it comes to video, when it comes to being on stage, they don't like to embrace the messy. Huge flaw. Huge flaw. And so it's almost like as a society, we started this thing where we're telling our kids, if you can't walk, don't crawl, dag on it. Either walk or stay down. That's sad. It's terrible advice. I hear it all the time. And it needs to change because we need to crawl before we walk. And even if you hire somebody that's got chops, there's going to be a phase of crawling as they get to know your company as they get to expand their horizons, et cetera, et cetera. Look at every amazing company that's done amazing things. They crawled before they walked. And so th that's going to happen with virtual, right? So with virtual, there's going to be this whole set of people that's like, I ain't going to do no virtual until we can do it right. That's No, I'm going to screw up virtual all over the place in 2017. <laughs> I'm going to have some jacked up virtual reality, and I can't wait because it means I'm winning. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and it's something that we all have to kind of, you know, accomplish from the inside out because it's all in our heads. And, and, and what, what you said on, you know, just so resonated with me, uh, you know, 
what, what you specifically said on the blog and, and what you've been talking about and giving some other awesome examples. But you said as a comparison, does a blogger have to be a great writer to start blogging? Does a company have to start to have a perfect business model before they open the doors? Does a teacher have to be a great teacher before they, before they set foot in a public school? Does a parent have to be a great parent before they decide to have the first child? And you said the answers to all these are no, 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 and no. And it just makes so much sense. And, and I, 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 I don't know necessarily I struggle with it. Uh, I mean, I do. I, I struggle with lots of this stuff. But I uh, I constantly, with my partner and our company here, I'm like, damn it, why weren't we doing these things a year ago? And then right after I say that, I I catch myself, and I was like, it's just not how it works, is it? Right? It's just not – I don't know how – he's probably listening well, right not. now. And, and, and he's heard me say that well, so many times. the fact is you're doing – yeah, you're doing more than 90%. It's just that people that are very into personal development and improving their situation, improving their business – they tend to we, – we tend to watch those that are doing things better than we are, and then all of a sudden we think that's the marketplace. That's not the marketplace. Those are those are the leaders. They, they're they leaders for a reason. So good for them. Good for them. Um, mm -hmm. they've, they've gone through the learning curve. Keep in mind there's a bunch of people behind us, though, at the same time. And so, you know, I've gotten used to this, but it is sad that so many businesses are buying into this – it's got to be perfect or we don't launch it. And um, with video, here's how I feel about video. It does need to sound good. Like the audio, the quality of the audio has got to be a 9 out of a 10. In terms of the visual experience, a 7 out of 10 or higher is acceptable. When we're talking to clients, if they get a 7 out of 10 or higher, to me that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the types of videos. Can you can you uh, talk about the types of videos that you think companies should get going with like right away? Like what are the first few videos that I think the, I think the have... number one type of video that should that the company should be doing is interview based videos with two people on the screen, two or more, but generally two people on the screen. One is the interviewer and one is the subject matter expert. Right? Both of them on the screen. And you say why both of them? You know, you you see a lot of videos where it's one person. Um, those videos, generally speaking, aren't nearly as effective in terms of really getting ha having a great conversation because here's the thing. A great interviewer can make anybody else look great on camera because – let me give an example. Let's say that you're doing a product demo, and you're doing the demo, and I'm the interviewer. And so I ask you a question. I'm like, okay, David, so um, so today we're going to have our viewers uh, learn about the new XYZ 2000 model, and you're going to give them uh, a demonstration on it. So uh, show us what are some of the features that you like, right? And so then you're going to start to talk, and then I'm going to say, as I, let's say hypothetically, just hypotheticals, let's say that I hear you start to struggle for some reason. I'm going to jump in. And I'm going to ask a question or I'm going to say something that allows you to catch your breath or, or catch your train of thought and keep going and, and pick it back up, right? So I'm there to pick you up when you start to fall. And the other thing is I'm there to hear things that you might not hear as a subject matter expert. And so you might say something like, you know, some unique piece of uh, technology. And I'm like, so, David, you just mentioned that the new XYZ 2000 has this uh, particular feature, that technology. For our viewers that don't understand what that means, break it down for me, right? And then all of a sudden you start breaking it down. So it's my view to see the world from the ignorant set of eyes, the, the viewer, the viewer who doesn't necessarily understand everything but wants to understand it. That's the power of the interviewer. And um, unfortunately, what happens is a lot of companies stick a camera in front of a person and they say go. And they expect the person to be able to pitch a camera like they pitch a customer. It just doesn't work that way. As humans, we're, we're better at talking to humans, okay, not cameras. And so if there's a human on the, on the screen with you, right, um, in the take with you, you will, you will, generally speaking, you'll do much, much better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm not a big fan of talking heads unless the person is just really good. Like I can do a talking head video because I, you know, the communication is my whole world. I, I, I speak yeah, I'll, stage I'll say it, and then, you know. I'll say it for you, Mark, is you're you're amazing dynamic speaker, which is what you built your entire business around. So yeah, I mean Maybe. yeah, you're 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 but you're, you're the exception, not 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 right. the rule. For, for that's that. right. That's exactly right. And so it's not fair to 
to think everybody is going to be able to do that. But if you do have an interview-based situation, more often than not, people can be amazing on camera and they'll do a ton of stuff on one take. That's where we get 15 to 20 videos in two to three hours is by that methodology right there. Okay. That's the biggest awesome. thing. That That is the most important thing right there, what I just described. Okay, and what about like so? Those are that's the format. How do how do you like? What what are some of like the subject matter videos? Like what what do you think if somebody was saying, okay, awesome, this guy Marcus has really inspired me to do these videos. Here are the first five videos that we're going to produce. Let's just get going with these. Okay. Do you have any sort of yeah? So you know, so on that? there's so I we address this always because this whole conversation video is a sales conversation. It should be your best sales tool. And so what you want to do when, you, when you're when you thinking about videos, um, your website is a very easy way to help you, um, to, to, to help give you a, a quick, almost like audit and outline of the video you should be producing. So let's say that you have a set of services on your website. Let's say you have five different services, so therefore five different service pages of the, each one of those individual services. Well, you should have a video on each one of those pages. And so usually where we start is what are the service and products, the major services and products that you offer as a company? You do an over, like an overview video on each one of those. That's where okay. you can start. Because the idea is as a company, on every major page of your website, you want to have at least one video. That's the idea. Okay? So okay. the next thing that you can do, the next thing you can do is you take the most common sales questions that you get in the first sales call. Okay, so I've met with sales organizations all over the world. And for almost every single one, 80% of the questions they get on the first call or the first meeting with the prospect are the same questions. It's the 20% that are unique. And so what you want to do is you want to write down those 80% of questions that you get every single time in that first sales appointment, and you address those individually. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so valuable? Because now that they're produced, as soon as you get the lead into the system, before the salesperson has first presentation, first call with them, the idea is that they've watched some of those videos so as to eliminate the 80% of questions that are just relative, the, you know, the stuff that, that everybody's asking. And what would happen to a salesperson's life if 80% of the questions they got asked by prospects were eliminated before they ever got there? That's powerful you stuff. Get, you should get paid less, right? <laughs> I mean, well, well, you should get paid less, but they they would they would be dramatically more effective because Absolutely. what would happen is your your sales appointment times go down, but the value of the sales appointment goes up. You increase closing rates while decreasing length of sales cycles because what the only thing fundamentally that decreases the length of a sales cycle is the trust level has to have increased. And the only way yep. trust level increase is the vetting process has to be more detailed, deeper. And the only way the vetting process is going to be more detailed and deeper is if we give them the ability, ability to vet us in a deeper way, hence video. This is what Which I is say to every sales team. If the first time someone hears your voice and sees how you look is on a, is on a sales appointment, you have failed them. Because they should have already seen you, heard you, listened to you, and understand your philosophy and your doctrine. And that has to be done through video. They should have already watched videos that you produced that was sent to them in that lead nurturing process as soon as they entered the system. That's how it should work. So those are the first two. Those are the first two. The third set of videos that I like to make is let's say you have a team page. And so you have a team page, and let's say you've got 20 employees. Let's say you've done a great job of creating pages about each one of those employees. Each one of those pages should have its own individual video of that person talking. That's almost like an intro video. And so, again, this is great for the sales team members because let's say a salesperson is setting up a first, um, a, a first sales call or presentation to a potential client. So they'll say, okay, well, now that we've set this up, I know when we have our first meeting, you're going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to send you two videos. One of the videos is addressing the major questions I know you're going to ask. I want you to watch it because it's going to save us a bunch of time and it's going to help us 
be dramatically more effective during our time. Now, the second video I'm going to send you is just a video of me. I want you to get a sense of who's going to be knocking on your door, um, what I look like, what I sound like, and this way, when I do knock on your door in your office, you're not going to think I'm an axe murderer. You know, it's just Marcus the pool guy, right? And so this, by doing this, by doing this, now you are going to accomplish that goal of do they know me? Do they know what I look like? Do they know what I sound like? And they, do they know my philosophies? Mm-hmm. I, I, I just have a, a feeling that the Riverpool and Spa sales team um, absolutely adores you. <laughs> I bet you anything, you have made their lives so easy. From inbound calls to closing 80% of the sales forum to all of this, man. I, I can just... I just I've never gone through your sales process. I'm not in your area, but I uh I can just feel that. Everything you're saying, I can just see it happening. That that is that is some awesome advice. Did you before I move on a couple other things here, did you have anything to add there? On I mean that's some good stuff. I think you gave some people some awesome direction on that. Yeah, I mean I think those, so those are the, are the big three. Okay. Yeah, those are those are the big three that I would I would tackle. And the cool thing about those is you can do them really fast. You know, they don't have to take a lot of time. And in in one other part about this, if you can, some people say, where should I shoot the video? I like to shoot the video as much as possible in in the work setting, right? And so if you have a a manufacturing facility, right? You you do it in the plant. You do it in the facility. If you have a major office, you do it in the office. Um, um, I'd absolutely recommend m most of the time using a lab mic. You should be spending more money on the mic than pretty much anything else, maybe other than the camera. And sometimes the mic well, can is you more mention that real quick? The then, I mean, can you mention that real quick? Because I had, we've gotten so much into I think the more important stuff that I kind of skipped over some things I was going to ask on the logistics of like minimum yeah, equipment and stuff like that. Can, can you just touch on that real quick? Because I don't want to. I like talking about this other stuff more, but that is important. So you've mentioned that a few times now, the mic, the quality, and I agree. If you, uh, if you can't hear, then and I don't want to give I don't want to give a I don't want to give a brand, but let me just say this: if you haven't spent two hundred dollars or more on your microphone, you haven't spent enough. Okay, that's just the quickest way to judge it. If you spend more than two hundred bucks on a lavalier mic, um, you're 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 really moving in the right direction. And I've gotten to the point that, you know, there's because I've done so many videos. As soon as and we use the boom mic and it's and it's fine and a lot of people think it's fine. It drives me crazy when we use a boom mic because I can hear the difference. And I I'm trying to get to the point where we never ever ever use a boom mic for anything if we don't have to, just because the lav mic is so much the, the quality is at such a higher level. What what is that called again? The what mic? Well, you got a boom mic, which is like you know, it's just yeah, a the, straight the mic that you over. put on top of your camera um, yeah. that you that is positioned towards the person, like a boom. Okay. They're good for if you're on the move and you're interviewing a bunch of people in a short period of time. Let's say in the room. Hey, Marcus. Marcus. Uh, hey, real quick. Yeah, the last about ten seconds, we cut out there a little bit. I don't know if anything changed on your end. On the audio. Can you hear it's me now? Funny, right, right, I can hear you now. Right when we were talking about audio, right? Well, we'll go in and edit that. Hey, Steve, real quick, can you make a note right around this time to go back and edit it? So we'll, let me just pick right back up from yep. um, the. Uh, yeah. The oh, yeah. And let me just let me just let me just let you know too. I've got to I've got to stop at three, and so I just want yeah. you to be aware. Um, nine yeah, we're we're about. To, yeah, we're about to. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, but oh yeah. So Marcus, tell me again about the uh, the equipment on the the mic. You mentioned that a couple times. What what advice so do you have there? So here here is a, just a real quick rule of thumb on the mics. You can't be cheap on the mics. So go with something that costs two hundred dollars or more. If you haven't spent two hundred dollars, you haven't spent enough. It's probably not a very good lav. Okay. So the lav is the one that you attach to your shirt or whatever. Then you have what's called a boom mic. Boom mics are fine. They attach to your equipment, but they just don't sound as good. In fact, once you really get into this, like I've gotten into this, you immediately hear the difference between a boom mic and a lav mic. And so we try not to use a boom mic um, unless we have to, unless we have to. So if it's a two-person interview, one lav 
um, between the two is usually enough, and it usually picks up both people just fine. Can you use two labs? Yes, you can do that as well. But usually one lab um, is, is, is enough that one of the, the interviewer is using, and it sounds good, and it's effective that way, and that's what I would suggest. Okay, and what about um, camera equipment? I mean, can you start by using your iPhone? I mean, is it is that a minimum? And I okay. I would, you know, look, we've got a lot of rich teenagers um, out there right now because they're not afraid to use iPhones to produce video content. Um, it's it's businesses and brands that are afraid to do that. Remember, it's a seven out of ten or higher for the visual, a nine out of ten or higher for the audio quality. And so an iPhone will absolutely give you a 7. It'll give you a 7. And so there's okay. nothing wrong with an iPhone. Now, are you going to graduate to a higher level? Probably so. And it's a good, it's a good thing to do at some point in time. But um, I would not hesitate to use your phone to produce a lot of your video content. Now, that video is probably not going to go on the home page of your website, right, because it might not quite have the look and feel that you want for the home page. But for a regular blog article, it's perfect. You know, for a product page, it might be great. And so I would not hesitate to do that. You know, but but most good cameras are going to be anywhere between, you know, $400 and $2,500. Could you go a lot more than that? Sure. But you can get some really great stuff in that range. And you can rent it. You can rent the equipment uh, as well. So there's no excuse. Yeah, you can rent it. You can try it out. And then you can say, okay, it looks like this is the best fit for us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. To kind of tie things up, I, w I want you to uh, debunk some of the video marketing myths that are floating around out there. Well, I, I think we've I think we've addressed some of them. Just on a few. Um, you've, number you've one, some of them is. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's a few. Video has to be perfect. No, it doesn't. I think we've hit that one pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody can be good on video. Well, that may or may not be true, but unless they're coached and given certain principles to, you know, to live by, then they're probably not going to be that good. But I have found that nine out of ten people I talk to can be very good on video with a little bit of coaching, with a little bit of coaching. Um, um, the idea that it just has to be – that it has to be perfect and that you have to have a script. Oh, my goodness. You do not have to have a script. My goodness gracious. <laughs> your sales team – doesn't meet with a prospect and read a script. You shouldn't be reading scripts on videos. Um, if you're reading a script, it's too complex, either that or you're just not a good enough subject matter expert. And, you know, truth be told, you do video the right way, you quickly learn who is a subject matter expert on your team and who's not. Now, you might want to have an outline that they follow, but they shouldn't be reading a script because the beauty behind um, – Video is it should ex feel extremely natural. It should feel exactly like a conversation, and so um, that's why I'm not a huge script guy because I don't I'm not into robots and we don't want to create robots. We want to create great communicative experiences for the audience, for the viewer, and that's what we can do if we just have conversations. We've talked about the two people versus one. I think that's critical. We've talked about you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. I mean, really, by spending, you know, a thousand bucks, you can get a really solid starter equipment and get rocking and rolling on this. You don't have to have studio. You just got to have the right desire and the right mindset. And uh, we talked about, you know, it takes a lot of time to produce video. Not true. You know, 15 to 20 in three hours is very common once you get this semi figured out. And so, yeah, I think that hits on a few of them. What about the length of the videos? Well, like length of video I think is a myth too because you hear all the time that a video shouldn't be longer than two or three minutes. That's the biggest pile of horse dung I've ever heard, and I'm going to tell you why. Because, because it's true that it shouldn't be longer than two or three minute, minutes if you're trying to create a viral video that gets, you know, has 15 million views on Facebook. But for most people listening to this, Viral isn't what we're going after. What we're going after is good sales-based content that answers customers' questions and moves them further down the funnel. So the fact of the matter is this. Let's say we talk pools. If somebody wants a pool, they might not want to watch – if they just thought about a pool last night for the first time, they might not want to watch a, a long video today. Maybe they just want to watch a two- or three-minute intro video to get a feel for things. 
But if somebody's getting ready to write a check for $100,000 on a swimming pool tomorrow, you better believe they'll watch a video that's 30 minutes long. And so the length of video should correlate with where they are in the buying decision more so than best practices for length. Gotcha. Awesome. Marcus, you've given us some gems here, as always. And I uh, appreciate it. And as I talk to you off recording here, uh, we're getting super heavy into this. And I am going to re-listen to this and have our team listen to this because you gave some super-duper take-homes that uh, we can apply right away and have to need to apply right away. So thank you so much. Um, how can people continue to follow and learn from you? Well, I just want to mention to everybody that um, my book is coming out. Um, it's uh, in January. It's They Ask You Answer. You can find it on uh, at Amazon. You just right. type in They Ask You Answer. It'll be right there. And okay. so make sure to check that out. You can find me at thesaleslion.com. On Twitter, I'm at thesaleslion. And you can email me anytime. It's marcus at thesaleslion.com. Awesome, buddy. Well, thanks so much, Marcus. Uh, looking forward to putting all this into practice, and uh, until next time. Yeah, brother, you take care. My pleasure. All righty.